I'm Bob Keneary, and today I'd like to talk about some religious sonnets. Now, the sonnet began in Italy with a lot more emphasis on worshipping an unattainable lady than on worshipping God. And that was certainly true of the sonnets I talked about in the first two talks in this series. Those took the story up through the Elizabethan age. White and Surrey, the courtiers of Henry VIII, who imported the sonnet to England from Italy, wrote such sonnets. And the Elizabethan courtier, Sir Philip Sidney, made the sonnet sequence fashionable. And most of the many sonnet sequences which followed his example were addressed to one or another unattainable lady. And there are some variations, of course. Uh, Edmund Spencer's sonnets uh, end in marriage, and Shakespeare's sonnet sequence is not all love sonnets, though certainly not religious. Curiously enough, though, the very first sonnet published in England seems to have been a sonnet sequence of religious sonnets. Anne Locke's A Meditation of a Penitent Sinner includes a 26-poem sonnet sequence based on Psalm 51, though her other works, translations of John Calvin in particular, were much more influential. Anyway, having usually failed to attain the lady, the sonnet turned to religion, a roundabout way of saying that the 17th century was the great period for religious sonnets. Now, I am saving more modern sonnets for later talks, and the 18th century much preferred the heroic couplet as a form. So today's talk is really about the 17th century, although maybe a little peek at 19th century sonnets. In the 17th century, though, even poets could not escape the religious issues of the day, which were all bound up with politics, a, a rather dangerous combination even today. For example, Anne Locke's Meditation and its sonnet sequence were published in 1560, soon after her return from several years in exile on the continent. Her problem was that she was too Protestant for her time. If you like, you can blame it all on Henry VIII. Henry VIII's separation of the Church of England from Rome set off a long struggle over the nature of that church between thoroughgoing Protestants of one sort or another and those who wished to retain as much of Catholic practice as possible or even return to communion with Rome. The politics of Henry's own court were heavily influenced by that issue, with wives and ministers trying to push the king in one direction or another. In most years, both wife and ministers were more Protestant than Henry himself. Now, the Protestant faction dominated the brief rule of Henry's immediate successor, his only son, Edward VI. But the subsequent reign of Edward's sister, Mary, saw England return to the Church of Rome. Now, their sister, Elizabeth, restored the Anglican Church, but it was not really Protestant enough for Calvinists like Anne Locke, some of whom were alienated enough to later emigrate to the Netherlands and then to a strange new place now known as Plymouth, Massachusetts. Now, both traditional Anglicanism and Puritanism produced some great poets, the earliest of whom was John Donne. Now, Donne was a great prose master as well, and if you certainly encountered at least parts of this passage from one of his meditations. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends, or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Uh, wonderful stuff, and worth contemplating whenever we are tempted to dismiss as not our business the suffering and 
so on, of the world. When Dunn wrote that passage, he was serving as dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Now, this was the original St. Paul's, which burnt down in the Great Fire of 1666 and was replaced with the gorgeous Christopher Wren building we see today. Dunn was by then more renowned as a preacher than as a poet. The sonnets I'm reading you today, in fact, weren't even published in his lifetime. But Dunn had originally embarked upon a secular career. He was raised a Roman Catholic, which was certainly not an advantage under Queen Elizabeth, but he was able to study at Cambridge, though not to receive a degree, and to become a lawyer. And his future seemed bright, particularly after he renounced his Catholicism and joined the Church of England. He was appointed chief secretary to one of the leading political figures at court at the age of 25. John Dunn was a bright and rather dashing young man. He had written satirical and erotic poetry, and he was said to be quite a womanizer. Now, all that was perfectly acceptable in late Elizabethan England. But then Dunn fell in love with and secretly married his boss's niece. Mm, an act which landed him and the priest who married him in prison. He got out, but it took 12 years for his in-laws to accept him. And in the meantime, he and his wife and their many children lived on the charity of his relatives and occasional legal fees. Now, she died in 1617 while giving birth to their 12th child. And this sonnet, number 17 of Dunn's Holy Sonnets, speaks of her death. Since she whom I loved hath paid her last debt to nature and to hers, and my good is dead, and her soul early unto heaven ravished, holy on heavenly things my mind is set. Here the admiring her my mind did wet to seek thee, God, so streams to show the head. But though I have found thee, and thou my thirst hast fed, a holy thirsty dropsy melts me yet. But why should I beg more love, when as thou dost woo my soul, for hers offering all thine, and dost not only fear lest I allow my love to saints and angels things divine, but in thy tender jealousy dost doubt, lest the world flesh Yea, devil put thee out. And love for his wife had led Dunn toward God, and her death has turned his mind to heavenly things. He's found God, but he wants more. But why should he ask for more when God pursues him like a jealous lover? Now, by the time that he wrote that, Dunn's fortunes were beginning to change, uh, or really had changed. Uh, he'd been devastated, of course, by the death of his much-loved wife, but Dunn had been brought to the attention of patrons by his verses, and finally to the attention of King James I himself. Now, James's great claim on literary history, of course, is commissioning the King James Bible, but he also deserves credit for recognizing the talent of John Donne. In 1615, James ordered a reluctant Donne to become an Anglican priest and then made him royal chaplain. Donne became Dean of St. Paul's six years later. It is thought that Donne wrote many, perhaps most, of the Holy Sonnets before becoming a priest. Sonnet number 14, in which Dunn begs God to give him strength to resist his worldliness, may help us understand his doubts about his worthiness for the priesthood. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand, or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town, to another do labor to admit you, 
but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captived and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again, take me to you, imprison me, for I, except you enthrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Dunn begs God to take him by force. He's like a town betrayed by those who supposed to defend it, and God must batter down the walls. Only by surrendering to God can he be truly free. Only if taken by God's love can he hope to be chaste. Perhaps I should note that moments of self-doubt are a normal part of the religious life and, and experienced, or so I am told, even by saints. Now, Dunn also recorded moments of exaltation, as in this next sonnet, Holy Sonnet number 10. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for well, thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor canst thou kill me. From rest and sleep, which but thy pictures be, much pleasure, then from thee much more must flow. And soonest our best men with thee do go, rest of their bones and soul's delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, and dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell, and poppy or charms can make us sleep as well and better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. John Donne was the greatest of the early 17th century poets known as metaphysicals, a term bestowed on them by 18th century critics who disliked their show of learning and the elaborate, sometimes strained metaphors they thought characteristic of the group. Uh, such metaphors are often known as metaphysical conceits or just conceits, and I believe it's a rule that you're supposed to mention the term whenever talking about metaphysical poets. Now, the modern reputation of the metaphysical poets was stimulated in the 20th century by Herbert Grierson's 1921 anthology shown on the screen and by the advocacy of T.S. Eliot. Other poets called metaphysical include Abraham Cowley, Henry Vaughan, Andrew Marvel, Richard Crashaw, and George Herbert. It's a pretty varied group, and like many such labels, metaphysical may suggest they have more in common than they actually do. Now, my own favorite among them is Andrew Marvel, but the best religious poetry is probably by George Herbert. Now, as his book uh, quoted on the screen suggests, George Herbert was a country parson. He actually came from a wealthy family. He, he'd been a brilliant student at Cambridge, and he had had a promising political career under James I. But his last decade was spent as a Church of England priest in a tiny village, and by all accounts, a conscientious, even saintly priest at that. Now, here's a sonnet which shows what he means by saying that ordinary things may serve as lights of things divine. Having been tenant long to a rich lord, not thriving, I resolved to be bold and make a suit unto him to afford a new small rented lease and cancelled the old. In heaven at his manor I him sought. They told me there that he was lately gone about some land which he had dearly bought long since on earth to take possession. 
I straight returned, and knowing his great birth, sought him accordingly in great resorts, in cities, theatres, gardens, parks, and courts. At length, I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. There I him espied, who straight your suit is granted, said, and died. Herbert imagines himself as a tenant farmer, presumably like many in his congregation. So not doing well, he wants to ask his landlord, that is God, for a new lease on better terms. But the landlord is not at home, but out in the world. The poet looks for him where one would expect to find someone rich, but instead finds him among sinners. God then grants the poet's suit, but dies upon the cross. This poem's elaborate metaphor is a good example of a conceit, but it's not really all that learned or metaphysical. It's designed to appeal to his congregation. Herbert died during the rule of James's successor, Charles I, whose struggle with Puritans in Parliament eventually led Charles to the chopping block and brought to power Oliver Cromwell, who'd led the Puritan army to victory in the Revolution and was eventually named Lord Protector, a kind of quasi-monarchy which he passed on to his son Richard. Uh, devout himself, uh, Cromwell found Parliament nearly as hard to deal with as Charles had. Uh, I mention this as an excuse to bring in one of my all-time favorite quotes, something Cromwell said to some fellow Puritans in exasperation. I beseech you, in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. If only we all thought of that possibility uh, more often. Uh, a better excuse for mentioning Cromwell, of course, is that the great Puritan poet John Milton was a rather important civil servant during Cromwell's reign. And Milton had already made his mark as a poet and polemicist even before the Puritans came to power. The quotation on the screen there is from his famous defense of freedom of speech, written in 1644. I want to read you a sonnet Milton wrote while he was serving under Cromwell. Its title is On the Late Massacre in Piedmont, and it is a response uh, to an 1855 massacre of some Waldensians. The uh, Waldensians were a Protestant sect in the Piedmont area of the Alps, in what is now northern Italy. After forced conversion failed, the Duke of Savoy had his troops slaughter about 1,700 of them, making them martyrs celebrated throughout the Protestant world. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old, when all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones. Forget not, in thy book record their groans who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks. Their moans the vales redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow o'er all the Italian fields, where still doth sway the triple tyrant that from these may grow a hundredfold, who, having learnt thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. Now the stocks and stones the Waldensians do not bow down to it would be the images of saints, the cult of the saints being particularly abhorrent to the Puritans. Now the triple tyrant is the Pope, who sometimes wore a triple crown. And the Babylonian woe is the Roman Catholic Church in general, routinely identified by the Puritans with the horror of Babylon from the Book of Revelations, uh, an identification one occasionally finds used still by some fundamentalist groups 
uh, even today. Now, the Puritan Revolution was a short-lived success, and it ended with the 1660 return of the Stuart dynasty under Charles II, as seen here in a rather uncharacteristically serious pose. And Charles was more interested in Nell Gwynne and so on than in religion or political theory. But the Church of England was again dominated by Catholic practices, and clergy were urged to teach the divine right of kings. Now, this restoration meant forced retirement for Milton, and he was going blind well before old age, uh, glaucoma. In my next uh, sonnet, he complains to God and then catches and reproves himself. But before I read it, let me refresh you on the biblical parable of the talents. It's found only in chapter 25 of the Gospel according to Matthew, though there's a very similar parable in Luke. In the parable, uh, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a rich man who undertakes a long trip and leaves some money, that is, talents at that time, with three servants, ten to one, five to another, and one to a third. Now, the first two invest what they get and double their money. And on his return, the Lord praises them as good and faithful servants and rewards them. The third, fearful of a harsh master, buries the money. The Lord is angry with him and takes the servant's single talent and gives it to the one who has ten. For Milton, of course, presumably the one talent he cannot bury away is poetry. Here's the sonnet. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker, and present my true account, lest he returning chide, Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask? But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. And Milton is asking how God can expect day labor of him when his whole world is plunged in darkness. And Patience responds that God needs nothing from him and has thousands of servants. It is for Milton to stand and wait. Now, those of you who share my perverse interest in sonnet technique it might note that the rhyme scheme is that of the traditional Italian sonnet form. But the sense of the poem does not break between the first eight and the last six lines, as tradition would prescribe, but in the very middle of the eighth line, a very unusual place for a sonnet. And Milton can play such games partly because he's doing so within a familiar form, so the reader should not need uh, big, obvious markers. In any case, Milton did not stand and wait. He went on to write Paradise Lost. Nor was the cause for which Milton had worked most of his life entirely lost. Uh, the Stuart Restoration was not the end of the story. Religious conflict between a Catholic-leaning monarchy and an aggressively Protestant parliament waxed strong again under Charles II's more pious and less savvy son, James II, till finally Parliament deposed him and vested the rule in his daughter Mary and her Protestant husband, William of Orange, an event which the winners dubbed the Glorious Revolution. Although thoroughgoing Protestants and exceptionally dogmatic Roman Catholics remained dissatisfied, the religious and political establishment of 18th century England was tired of religious strife and frowned on what they termed enthusiasm. Uh, 
and the Church of England fell into a deep sleep, though troubled by the rise of Methodism. Uh, the insistence on the Protestant succession meant that the throne passed next to the House of Hanover and a series of rather unattractive Georges. In general, the 18th century was not a good century for religious poetry, though both John and Charles Wesley wrote some much-loved hymns. Barely alive in the 18th century, the sonnet was revived by 19th century romantics. Now, most of you will have read poems like Shelley's Ozymandias or Keats's On First Looking Into Chapman's Homer, though you may or may not have been told that they were sonnets. But for religious sonnets, we must turn to the first generation of romantics, Coleridge and Wordsworth. And both became more conventional religion as they grew older. And Coleridge wrote a tedious book of lay sermons, and Wordsworth wrote a whole book of ecclesiastical sonnets, mostly not worth reading. But before growing old and conventional, uh, both wrote some poems in which the romantic love of nature comes very close to a kind of pantheism. In the sonnet I'm going to read next, Coleridge says that he knows that some will think him foolish for seeing God in nature, but that doesn't bother him. It may indeed be fantasy, when I essay to draw from all created things deep, heartfelt, inward joy that closely clings, and trace in leaves and flowers that round me lie lessons of love and earnest piety. So let it be, and if the wide world rings in mock of this belief, it brings nor fear nor grief nor vain perplexity. So will I build my altar in the fields, and the blue sky my fretted dome shall be, and the sweet fragrance that the wild flower yields shall be the incense I will yield to thee. The only God I and thou shalt not despise, even me, the priest of this poor sacrifice. Now, this sense of nature as a sublime was a relatively new idea. Uh, is an 18th century notion, along with the idea that mountains and rough seas were not mere inconveniences, but sites worth traveling to see. The sea is calm, however, in the next sonnet I will read. It's a sonnet by William Wordsworth. Now, as a general rule, early Wordsworth is worlds better than late Wordsworth, and the sonnet I'm about to read dates from 1802, and just four years after he and Coleridge had announced a new kind of poetry in their joint publication, Lyrical Ballads. It combines romantic exaltation of nature with their cult of childhood innocence. It is a beauteous evening, calm and free. The holy time is quiet as a nun, breathless with adoration. The broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility. The gentleness of heaven broods o'er the sea. Listen, the mighty being is awake and doth with its eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlastingly. Dear child, dear girl that walkest with me here, if thou appear untouched by solemn thought, thy nature is not therefore less divine. Thou liest in Abraham's bosom all the year and worshipst at the temple's inner shrine, God being with thee when we know it not. Wordsworth may appreciate the sublimity of the scene, but his child in her innocence is even closer to the divine. Now, this is one case in which knowing the background of a poem does not make you appreciate it more, but I guess I might as well tell you anyway. Uh, the child in question was his 10-year-old daughter, Bayonette Vallon. Uh, 
a French woman he had fallen in love with when he had gone to France in 1791, excited by the early stages of the French Revolution. He had not seen the child since hastily leaving France the next year. And he was seeing her now because he was on a visit to France to tell Annette that he was marrying an Englishwoman, despite having earlier said he wished to marry her. Now, the only thing that does do him credit in this is that he did pay the 19th century equivalent of child support for the rest of his life, and partly at the urging of his new British wife. For our last religious sonnet, I'd like to read one by the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. Now, Hopkins is a one-of-a-kind poet. He's technically a late Victorian, but he's often thought of as the first modern poet, both because of a rather experimental style and because much of his poetry wasn't published until 1918. But this sonnet falls fairly squarely within the Romantic and Victorian tradition of finding God in nature. Here it goes. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, O oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. The whole natural world shines forth the grandeur of God. Why then do we not bow before him? We have defaced the beauty of nature. We cannot even feel the ground beneath our feet being shod. But nature always lives, and morning follows night, for it is in the care of the Spirit of God. Well, I'm afraid that in our next talk, uh, the sonnet abandons piety and has a love affair, uh, making the talk less uplifting, but perhaps more interesting. In the meantime, I'm Bob Canary. I'm a long-retired professor of English from the University of Wisconsin-Parkside, and I thank you for listening. <laughs>